There was a time when Kevin Garnett was regarded by many as the sport's best player. He nearly claimed back-to-back -back MVPs before team failures derailed his stature. Critics called him a weak offensive player who couldn't lead a team to a championship. But was that true? What if his team's weaknesses actually drowned out his strengths? What if KG's championship value came from everything besides scoring? And what if Kevin Garnett was actually a blend of offense and defense that made him one of the best two-way players ever? You are watching what greatness is all about. Where's Larry Bird in all this? Has it blocked by Elijah on? Michael Jordan <laughs> saves the day. This series tackles one question. Who was the best at his best? We start at the ABA merger and go through the best multi-year stretches, examining the legends who provided the most on-court impact. These are the greatest peaks. Kevin, you, you're doing as well as you did last year, personally, but I tend to get the This feeling, ain't golf. Huh? This, this ain't golf. This ain't tennis. It ain't about me. Throughout this series, the defensive greats that we've looked at have all been big, active shot blockers who patrolled the paint. But Garnett was an evolutionary leap forward. At nearly seven feet without shoes, he had the height of a traditional intimidating center, yet moved like a perimeter player. This unique combination of length and mobility allowed him to cover large swaths of the court in only a few steps, which turned him into a basketball octopus on defense. Here, he starts toward Kobe Bryant from about 30 feet away from the hoop, slides his feet twice, and just vaporizes his drive from behind. These long tentacles could erase shots from the top of the circle like this, but it was Garnett's incredible mobility and awareness that separated him as a defender. His large hops quickly took him from the perimeter to the rim and positioned him to jump on a whim. And agility like this for someone his size is unheard of. He's running backwards here, swivels inside toward the ball, then back to the other side in one motion and defends the dunk in transition. With those huge strides, he could slide in front of quicker players on the perimeter and stay with them. Against the lightning quick Allen Iverson here, he makes it look easy. And Garnett could move well in every direction, recovering backwards here before a Dr. Octavius arm breaks up the pass. And even with those physical gifts, I think his best defensive attribute was his mind. This is nanosecond processing to let his teammate contest, and the awareness to follow the shooter's eyes makes the steal possible. KG tracked the ball better than maybe any player in NBA history. He was a hardwood sentinel, materializing in the paint the instant he detected a threat. He's chasing a wing here, but lingers when he senses danger in the pick and roll. Then when it's kicked out, he knows this teammate can rotate to the shooter, but his radar detects an up fake, so he stays and just destroys what would be a layup. It takes a second look to realize the brilliance of some of these decisions. This play seems pretty vanilla, but Minnesota's actually in a zone. Michael Oluwakandi should slide here with Garnett staying in the middle, but Garnett recognizes that would leave him on an island against Kobe, so KG audibles to slide up and protect the whole weak side himself, and because wings can't blow by him, it turns into a long three. Watch the ball on any Garnett play, and he feels like a normal rim protector. But watch more closely, and the plays become remarkable. He cheats over to the strong side early to take the roll man if needed, then still pounces on the dribbler at the rim. These plays were the norm for him, stalking the ball like a middle linebacker and shrinking the dimensions of the court. This reaction could make a precog jealous. The second Carmelo Anthony has space here, Garnett moves and his pogo sticking puts him in position to spring up at any moment. What a sequence. He reacted so fast at times it looked choreographed. He's moving in sync with the crossover from the other side of the court, then teleports to the front of the rim, and it takes a circus shot to beat that defense. KG was just everywhere, all the time, and he never stopped moving. 
I mean, he still really hasn't stopped moving. I think the man might hop around in his sleep like a shark. And this perpetual motion let him bounce from one threat to the next over and over. And his combination of length, agility, and perhaps the highest revving motor in NBA history meant KG was never out of any play, my, my word. And on top of all of that, he knew every trick in the book. He sends his teammate to double the post, zoning up these two big men, and he knows in this set his man is looking for the entry pass instead of shooting, and he can break it up from the free throw line. His positioning was often perfect and tactical, here sitting in a driving lane, and as the ball approaches he slides to play the pass, but keeps himself within arm's length, and Garnett's hands are too good to escape that gambit. He had that Bill Russell move from episode 8, tracking potential passes with his offhand as he contested shots, and Garnett played drop-off passes like this incredibly well, not always going after a block or contesting in the air, and frequently jabbing toward a penetrator and then peeling off it if he felt a pass coming instead. Here it is against a teenage LeBron James. Garnett reads his eyes and court position to quickly play the passing lane and then still recovers back to contest. He hopped on the up fake there and that was a minor crack in KG's armor, but there weren't too many other weak spots. He was vulnerable to power only against the strongest of the brutes, which meant Shaq and maybe a few other really strong big men at the time. But I think playing at around 240 pounds in those years with his high center of gravity made his incredible help defense slightly less effective in traffic where he couldn't lodge himself firmly under the rim to disrupt these kinds of plays. But it's hard to find him making defensive mistakes. On this one, he actually relaxes when the shot goes up he usually plugs the passing lane here instead of ball watching. And here he's chasing a wing around and that prevents him from turning around and covering up this breakdown. In situations where he needed to rotate into space, Garnett was an excellent rim protector and he's perhaps the most schematically sound defender I've ever studied, almost never flubbing assignments. Avery Johnson actually once complained that he would call out your plays on the court because he scouted opponents so well. This scouting helped him play passing lanes where those cephalopod arms suction cupped a number of balls and made even basic passes difficult. KG averaged nearly two steals per 100 during those years, elite for a big man, and with him on the court in 03 and 04, the Timberwolves defense was the equivalent of a top 10 D, but without him they played like a bottom 5 defense because his defensive teammates ranged from mediocre to porous during those seasons. PIPM, which uses this kind of plus minus data along with the box score, views these years as a top 15 defensive peak since 1997 and using only plus minus data and adjusting for teammate and opponent quality, these are seen as two of the very best defensive seasons on record. KG was also an excellent man defender against nearly anyone. His length made shooting uncomfortable, and he was one of the few players in league history who could truly guard five positions. Wings who attacked him were met with heavy resistance, and a number of dangerous perimeter players wouldn't even go at him on switches. Those who did attack him, even in the open court, could meet the long arm of the law, and his capacity to change directions with those tap dancing feet made the impossible look easy. This is a 60-0 stop and swivel back to block Kobe at the top of the square. That doesn't make sense. Shaq was probably the only true mismatch for him in the entire league, but even against big centers, he still held his own. Here, he doesn't bite on a fake from the 280-pound Vitaly Potapico, although, again, occasionally up fakes could be a problem. Chris Webber gets him with the second move here, but Webber desperately needed up fakes against Garnett because he posted a 44% true shooting mark against him in these seasons. Kevin also really bothered Tim Duncan, holding him under 50% true shooting when they were on the court together from 2002 to 2004. 
That's about 7% lower than Duncan's normal efficiency. And amazingly, when both KG and Duncan were on the court for those 12 games, their team scored the exact same number of points. Unfortunately, since Garnett was emerging from an era of golden centers, blocking under two shots per game wasn't quite enough to win over Defensive Player of the Year voters who were looking for three or four blocks from a seven-footer. But his defense was rarely under fire after each playoff elimination during these seasons. Instead, the questions were about Garnett's offense and specifically his ability to score. Magic is listening right now. Magic. Kevin Garnett does not have the supporting cast. If he had James Worthy, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, or Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, he would be winning championships right now. By far, the biggest criticism of Garnett was his inability to take over games with his scoring in key moments. Where Tim Duncan was celebrated as a classic low post weapon, Garnett was lamented as just a jump shooter. The same stigma attached to David Robinson back in episode seven. Ironically, Garnett was actually one of the best outside shooting big men of his era. He made nearly 43% of his long twos in 2003 and four, which was the seventh best mark in the entire league. This was better than Dirk Nowitzki in those seasons. And much like what we saw last episode from Kobe Bryant, KG could pull these from deep off a jab step. And since he had an incredible handle for a player his size, he could probe into these shots like he was a guard. KG's ball handling was so secure that Minnesota had him bring it up at times when they ran out of point guards, and sometimes he just worked that right into a pull-up jumper. Of course, there's still that trade-off we've discussed on these long outside shots, even though Garnett was four percentage points ahead of league average on his long twos, they weren't that efficient as a half-court shot, at least early in the shot clock, and that can limit a player's overall efficiency. Unlike Robinson, Garnett didn't have a first step that just marched him to the free throw line constantly. His initial move wasn't quite as quick, and more importantly, he lacked the strength and power to drive through minor contact. Hand checking like this derailed his penetration, and old friend Carl Malone bothered him this way in the 2004 Western Finals, pushing him off his spots and rerouting him with little nudges and arm bars. It's subtle, but you can see it here. A little push sends Garnett toward the baseline instead of being able to explode up on the strong side of the cup. Then he thinks better of challenging Shaq. The brick wall that was O'Neal deterred KG's forays to the basket in their playoff matchups, primarily because Kevin couldn't rise up and finish through contact well. Instead, he avoided contact in many of these aerial situations, which suppressed his free throw numbers. Unlike sturdier big men with broader shoulders, Garnett couldn't power through shot blockers like this. And because he didn't have the balance to drop step and claim that space on the near block, he often adjusted into trickier shots, although he never gave up on a play. Some of this was from his high center of gravity. It only took minor contact to throw him off balance when he was upright, but this was more of a limitation than an Achilles heel. He was still able to lean into some contact at the rim, and Garnett's free throw rates during these seasons were around average among typical 20-point scorers. He didn't always shy away from contact either, sometimes backing down softer players until he was fouled or found a closer look. When he could turn the corner on his drives, that downhill pressure also drew fouls, and he was more comfortable jumping off of one leg into open space on these flowing attacks. In instances where he was cut off, that handle helped him probe closer and closer to the rim, and he often went to this spin back move when he was walled off on his penetration. Have I mentioned he's a seven footer? KG added another layer to his dribble drives with his passing, which is functionally how perimeter players spearhead great offense, collapsing defenses and then dishing to open teammates. And in this sense, Garnett's desire to play like a six foot 12 Michael Jordan traded in hook shots for perimeter playmaking and some of these passes were really nice, finding layups at the end of drives like a great guard would. 
He even had the capacity to manipulate defenders occasionally using the look away here on the drop off, only there was rarely a great finisher on the end of these connections. He also dimed up cutters from the top. His size and instinct to quickly move the ball helped him find most of these openings. Man, it was hard to score on those pistons. And on this one, he's reading the primary screening action to his left, so he's a touch late firing this inside to his teammate. He was arguably better as a passer out of the post. He'd pick teams apart if they fell asleep, and he could find some gems on tight cuts like this too. With all of that said, I think his most impressive passes were on the interior, where he could wheel into scoring position and punish defenses in narrow quarters after they helped onto him. Some of these were just ridiculously good. He's anticipating a double because he's matched up with a guard, and he even busted out some misdirection from the post too, patiently looking to the perimeter here before shipping a Nikola Jokic special. Boom, oh, just like hey. that. That's perfect. Of course, Garnett could also score out of the post too. He didn't live on the low block like traditional big men, but he was effective down there, especially on deep catches. He threw in an up and under move every once in a while. Goodbye. Goodbye. Although despite some tutelage from Kevin McHale, I think he could have used pump fakes more down there to keep defenders honest and draw fouls. Instead, KG lived off a steady diet of fadeaways over either shoulder. And again, it's easy to see Jordan's influence on Garnett's offensive approach on some of these back to the basket moves. The incredible height of KG's release made this shot nearly unblockable, and he could flow right into the fade or set it up with a quick spin in one direction before falling back in another. The earliest synergy data from 2005 and 6 pegs him as the third most efficient post player in the league and first among volume scoring big men. So while he didn't live on the interior or at the free throw line like other big men, there was enough in Garnett's bag to make him a good but not great scorer. Because of some of his limitations, his playoff scoring numbers lag behind most players in this series. Although his regular season numbers are strong enough that he might have been more efficient with a larger playoff sample or with better teammates. Garnett never played with a grade A shot creator or passer during these seasons, instead suiting up next to scoring oriented point guards like Sam Cassell. These guards could play the pick and pop game with KG, who scored tons of points by floating to the perimeter after a screen and comfortably draining long jumpers. But he was missing teammates who could take advantage of his movement with high quality passing, let alone spoon feed him easy baskets. This is an easy roll pass or even a lob for a layup, but it never arrives. And they couldn't unlock his size and athleticism rolling downhill that much, despite his ability to get way up on lob passes. Many of Garnett's easy bunnies were in transition because he sprinted so hard on every play. Scientists might want to check if he was powered by cold fusion because like clockwork, he took off on every breakout and could beat other big men down the court. And even though he never played with a road runner point guard, KG flashed his downhill finishing ability on these fast breaks. Despite his intensity, he played 40 minutes a game in the regular season and 44 minutes a night in the playoffs because Minnesota lacked depth and he did make some uncharacteristic plays late in games from what seemed to be fatigue. Another issue with those teams was a lack of three-point shooting. They took a ton of long twos and surrounded Garnett with subpar three-point shooters, which meant they couldn't penalize teams for doubling in the post or take advantage of his kickout passes. The Timberwolves finished 27th in the league in three-point attempts in these seasons, taking half as many as Hakeem's Rockets did a decade earlier, which feels criminal given Garnett's timing and feel for kickout passes and the success we've seen three-point shooters have surrounding other big men who weren't on Garnett's level as a passer. This might be one of the reasons the Timberwolves offense fell flat in the playoffs, moving from the 89th percentile in the regular season to the 30th percentile in the postseason. 
although I think injuries were likely a larger factor. Minnesota played without a viable backup point guard on the floor one third of the time, and the Wolves offense dropped by nine points in those minutes. Even with just half of that drop off, their playoff efficiency would look much closer to their strong regular season offense. Like Robinson before him, so much of the big ticket's value was his ability to play off another high-end offensive talent while simultaneously leading the defense, the precise role he would play after moving on to greener pastures. Greetings, Cap the Legend. Greetings, King Garnett. Know my name. It's pretty clear that Garnett couldn't ramp up his scoring volume another 15 or 20% to the levels we've seen in the last three episodes. But his scoring numbers certainly would have been boosted with teammates who could have created easy shots for him or optimized his activity without the ball. That off ball game was a big part of his offensive package where he could catch and go right into his moves, and whether he was attacking a closeout after picking and popping, or just moving into a catch and shoot jumper like a supersized guard, Garnett could score quickly. You may have noticed that he often passed quickly too, there's another long two, and split second decision making like this, such as short roll passing, helps maintain advantages, and a quick hitting game doesn't take away opportunities from teammates. Here he gives it up and instantly cuts into a scoring chance against the clock, and he misses a pass but wheels right into a big bucket. KG hit most of these short roll connective tissue kind of passes, and we saw this with Larry Bird where dynamic sometimes touch passes create a kind of frictionless low viscosity offense where speedy actions kind of grease the rails for teammates. These skills add value next to better and better players, which is exactly why four years later, Boston took the league by storm behind an older, less agile Garnett. His extra passing fit next to Paul Pierce and Ray Allen, as did his off-ball scoring game in those catch-and-shoot situations. Add in Garnett's non-stop activity and ability to fill in any role or area on the floor, and Boston produced a good regular season and postseason offense. But it was their defense that carried them to a championship. Garnett lifted Boston to historical heights on that end and was the linchpin of a unit that locked down a scorching Lakers offense, authoring one of the most impressive NBA Finals I've seen from a defender. He couldn't leap quite as high or slide quite as well, but he stalked Kobe Bryant on a number of plays like this and won a high-level game of basketball chess, anticipating specific passes and plugging any gaps in the back line. He goes to help on this drive and then instantly somehow processes James Posey helping off of Bryant, so he rotates back and then smothers Bryant at the hoop. A key part of Boston's defensive success was Garnett's ability to defend the pick and roll, and he was even better at this art during his peak all of his S-class abilities intersected in pick and roll defense, sliding in front of smaller players, blanketing the entire court, and recovering to the ball if needed. And he was absolutely incredible at containing dribblers in this coverage, somehow preventing a split here from Chauncey Billups, and at times it looked like he was a mirror of the ball handler, sliding with him but almost always recovering back into the play. And if he needed to stay with a guard, that was no problem either. Again, the hand tracks the basketball for the steal. Thanks to his positioning and size, Garnett was also an excellent defensive rebounder, and he did a ton of little things like this so well. For instance, he was the first player I saw use this screen move to seal off a shot blocker for a driving guard. This play is from the year 2000. Add it all up, and Garnett might contribute positive value in more areas than any player ever, which is why he boasted some of the very best plus-minus numbers ever recorded from the regular season. These scoreboard-based stats tend to view KG as a strong all-star on offense too, although playoff metrics that rely on the box score are lower on him, 
primarily because of his scoring numbers. But remember, those box score numbers don't capture his smothering horizontal value on defense, and they are based on a small sample against only a few opponents. If we accounted for the huge minutes that he played, he'd look more like a top 20 peak or so in box plus minus and PIPM, but I still think that undersells his impact. Despite his warts as a scorer, Garnett's quick passing, offensive versatility, spacing, and defense make him one of the most scalable players in league history, perfect for supercharging any remotely contending team as an offensive number two and defensive superstar. And that combination of all-star level talent on offense and historically great defense gave Kevin Garnett one of the NBA's greatest peaks. For more historical content and to support this channel, head over to patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball and check out Thinking Basketball, the book on Amazon. That goes deeper on a number of ideas explored in this series. There are also longer discussions on many of these players on the Thinking Basketball podcast. And if you're curious about stats from this video, there's an entire stat series on this channel. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one and that wherever you are, you're having a great day. Got to be able to get some offense going. What a bit off the inbound, off the glass. <laughs> Automatic. When was the last time you saw that play run for a center?